Hi, Adam here. Um, yesterday was Halloween, one of my favourite times of the whole year. Uh, people that have worked with me know I like to dress up in the office if it uh, suits the environment, and I like to do stuff for the local kids, and uh, every year I manage to sort of su uh, successfully scare people, um, you know, in a fun way, in a nice way, don't get me wrong. And that got me thinking about something else that's coming up in the next few months that is also quite a scary event for a lot of employees. And I am, of course, talking about the annual performance review. So why is it scary for people? What, what makes it this fearsome event? And um, I mean, it, this is something, you know, it's not unique to places I've worked. It's uh, all sorts of people across the organization. Um, people will say like, oh gosh, my, I've got my annual performance review booked this week. I'm, I'm, I'm really nervous about it. I'm, I don't know what they're going to say. And it's kind of like, well, no, you can't read people's minds. You won't know exactly what it's going to say. But the golden rule of the annual performance review is that there should be no surprises. Neither the employee or the manager should really be raising anything that isn't already known. Um, you know, I mean, barring, you know, something that literally kind of happened in the last few days. Um, you know, the, um, as I've spoken before, there should be a continuous exchange between the uh, the employee and the manager, the reviewer and the reviewee, and an annual performance review should be, you know, a recap of the previous performance, confirming what is known between the two, and certainly in my opinion, really primarily a forward look. You know, I mean, the thing is you can't change the past. <laughs> you can change the future. We want the best out of people. We want to be talking about the exciting future pieces. We should already have been talking about the existing performance. We should already have said what's good, what needs work. You know, none of this should be a surprise. None of this should be that scary event that genuinely, when I say nervous, you see people highly anxious, really sweating at this, uh, this meeting coming up. And this also brings me on to a feature of the majority of annual performance reviews, which I've had reason to increasingly question over the years, the annual rating. Now, people do ratings differently. You see sort of different scales of it. Some uh, I've seen quite granular with sort of eight or nine different levels. Some I've seen um, almost sort of as basic as you can make it uh, and still provide some distinction uh, with four levels. And the question I've come to ask myself is who are they for? You would think an annual performance rating was for the individual, is to let them know how they're doing. But does it? Does it accomplish that? I've said again, performance conversations, how you're doing at the moment, should be a continuous conversation through the year. Um, so, and there should be no surprises at the end of year review. So people should know how they're performing, if they're doing well, if they need to work on things. And being given what is a, a rating out of four, five, whatever it might be, does that really tell you much as an individual, as the person receiving a rating, if it's kind of like, oh, uh, I, I'm good. All right, great. Um, and my issue with it over the years is just that, for me, it really undermines the performance conversation. Because the thing is, it's, it's an award. You are reducing someone's entire 12 month experience down to a single rating. And if that's unexceptional, if people are like, oh yeah, yeah, no, no, okay, I understand that. Okay, it, it's not really added much value to the employee, they understand it. But if they're not expecting it, if they disagree with it, suddenly the whole conversation is, is not about your performance and how you're going to develop. 
your performance is now fixated back on the previous 12 months. It's an argument. It's like, well, no, justify it. And the thing is, you're actually creating antagonism in the performance process. And again, for me, surely that is undermining the conversation. So we've got an annual performance rating that is either telling an employee something they already know, adding much value, or it's telling something the employee doesn't know and doesn't agree with, and in which case they're going to dispute it, and suddenly you're into a confrontation about a single word rating. So if it's not adding much value for the employee, who is it adding value for? And the thing is, organisations do get a lot of value from having ratings. Um, from uh, I'm a reward professional, okay? I've been for about 10 years now dedicated in it. And the thing is, yeah, ratings help. If we're doing an annual salary review, if, we're, uh, if we have a performance element to bonus, this is our framework for how we will distribute it across the whole employee group. So having performance ratings is very beneficial for us. It makes our life easier. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to ask a whole company go through it just to make my life easier. Surely there are alternatives. And again, it's just like the rating is useful for a company. Um, it means that you can actually pass up something about a company's performance to the top level. You can kind of do cross checks to see if different managers are sort of perceiving employment in the same way so that you can find out if an employee is maybe underappreciating a team or indeed overappreciating a team. Very famously, once I was in a, a peer review of managers and we discovered that essentially one manager out of this group of four in the same department was pretty much rating his employees one level higher. So yeah, kind of, you know, that was helpful to reset expectations within the team and kind of reframe the performance conversation. But again, that was only necessary because we were giving out ratings across everyone. We were trying to create this, um, you know, reduce these people down to a single word again. And on top of all of this, you then have the ultimate terror, which is if you have a distribution curve, a forced distribution, you shall only give out so many of the top ratings. You must give out so many of the bottom ratings. What? <laughs> and the logic is kind of reasonable. It's saying, you know, oh, in a normal distribution, we'll have high performers, we'll have low performers. We should expect to see this kind of curve. But again, for me, is it really? Um, all companies aspire to be a high performance organization. We want top performers in our organization. If you're succeeding, surely you will have more people in the top ratings. Surely they will be your exceptional performers. But to sort of say, no, you can only have so many and vice versa at the lowest end. I mean, most companies, if you're doing performance management, you're having conversations. If someone is underperforming, that should be addressed through the year. So if someone's underperforming, basically, they should either be managed up, increasing their performance, or if that's not possible, managed out because they're not able to perform the role. So the concept that... Uh, Actually, we should now have, we should always have low performers at the time of the annual performance review. It's just, can you hear yourselves? Why are you insisting that we must have a performance problem? Why are you insisting that we can't be a high performance organization? And so again, who is the annual performance rating for? What value is it adding to our core goal of developing our people, motivating our people and setting them up for success? 
I think it's pretty obvious which side of the do we do ratings or don't we do ratings debate I sit on at the moment. It's been a, a large one in human resources circles for many years. But it's just something that I want to share these questions for you. If you're running a system and you're thinking about how it operates, ask yourself the central question, who is this rating for? All right. Thanks very much. Happy Halloween. And I hope you have a good one. Bye.